Hi everyone, thanks for watching. Welcome to Past Physiology review of topic three material. Specifically, we will be discussing bone fracture repair and bone diseases, tumors, and some uh, hormone pathways involved with bone, including vitamin D, parathyroid hormone, and growth hormone. And yes, I said vitamin D after hormones, okay? Vitamin D technically is a hormone even though they call it vitamin D. Kind of a weird thing, but a random fact that's not really fun, but we'll call it a fun fact anyway. So let's get started. What you see on the left side of the screen is uh, the, the textbook, okay, figure 818. <clears throat> it's gonna very simply uh, show you the process by which a bone fracture is, uh, is healed, okay? And if you look over at my study guide, down in the bottom half here, um, we've got all the stuff that I kind of mentioned. We're going right to the middle, fracture healing. It's super simple, it's four steps, and it really can be about this simple. Hem it starts with a hematoma, so you have a, you have a break in the bone, blood rushes in and forms a blood tumor. Hema, heme, blood, toma, oma, tumor. Okay, oma, toma, oma, that's a tumor. This is a blood tumor. The hematoma, okay, brings in a bunch of blood and all kinds of inflammatory and growth factors and cells, okay, white blood cells and all this, okay, complicated stuff that you don't need to know for this, uh, for our purposes today, but you need to know that there's a blood tumor called a hematoma, and then uh, that hematoma attracts all this stuff, okay, which will eventually form uh, a fiber cartilage or soft callus uh, thing, okay, to replace that blood tumor. So basically, this is just called a soft callus that replaces the blood tumor. What it is, is fibrocartilage, and it's because all these different cells came in, um, including chondrocytes, and, and built this up, okay? And then this soft callus is replaced by a hard callus. Nice. That's just calcium depositing in and replacing all this um, cartilage, this fibrocartilage. It's just calcium depositing and, and creating a, a hard callus. And then that hard callus is remodeled by osteoclasts who lice down that uh, extra callus material. And then osteoblasts can lay down new bone underneath the periosteum. And then they'll get trapped in their little pockets that we call lacunae because they've turned into osteocytes and the lacunae and they'll maintain uh, bone tissue, okay? So really it's just a hematoma replaced by a soft callus, replaced by a hard callus. And then the bone is remodeled into uh, a more normal type of bone. Obviously, it will have a you know a different shape, and this is something you could see if you you know looked at the bone, maybe on an X-ray or you know after they died and you dug up their bones or whatever. You could see evidence of breaks um, by imperfections in in the bone. But this is the process. It's four steps. It's super simple. That's about all you need to know. Uh, if we look at my guide over here, we're gonna go down and then make our way back up. Okay. So osteitis refers to inflammation of bone. Anytime you see itis, it means inflammation. Oste means bone. Osteitis is inflammation of bone. Uh, it could come from injury, but it's most likely due to an infection. There are two types of osteitis, periostitis and osteomyelitis. Periostitis is inflammation of the periosteum on the outside. Osteomyelitis in the middle, myelitis in the middle, okay? Medullary cavity, middle, myelitis. Osteomyelitis is on the inside of the bone, and that's almost always going to be coming from an infection. Tuberculosis is, uh, you know, the bacteria uh, infection that when people uh, have a weakened immune system, it can create problems in their lungs. A lot of people are exposed to it, but uh, it's usually thought of as a lung pathology, but it can move to the vertebrae and, you know, most commonly the thoracic vertebrae because they're near the lungs. And when tuberculosis spreads to the vertebrae, they'll destroy the spongy bone inside the vertebral body, uh, which can, you know, which will weaken the bone and can lead to a pathological collapse or fracture those vertebrae. That disease is called Pott's disease. So a way you might want to think of this is that, you know, think of a clay pot and think of a clay pot hitting the ground. It's going to smash very easily. So if you think of clay pots, Think of smashing clay pots and then somehow connect that to TB, okay? Because tuberculosis causes a weakened destruction, okay, which is easy to fracture the vertebral bodies, okay? That's Pott's disease. So basically, Pott's disease is tuberculosis in the bones, okay? 
it's going to be in the vertebra, most likely the thoracic vertebra. It could go beyond, but pretty much thoracic vertebra. Uh, tumors, there are only a few types of tumors that you're expected to, to know for this exam. You'll learn a whole bunch more in other classes, uh, but just know, at least know benign compared to malignant tumors. So benign tumors affecting bone most commonly would be osteochondromas and osteomas. Um, they're just little expansile growths of bone that are not a problem. Um, uh, or at least they're not life-threatening. They could cause discomfort if they're in a bad spot, okay? But they are benign. They are not dangerous. Um, osteochondromas are the most common benign bone tumor. Um, and once again, they're not a problem. That's why I put them in green. Green means go. Green is good. As opposed to red is like, uh, you know, red, blood, bad, scary, you know, caution, whatever. Um, red flags, etc. So malignant tumors... Uh, osteosarcoma is a common one. Um, another malignant tumor that affects bone is going to be multiple myeloma. Uh, multiple myeloma is technically a, like a, a B cell uh, problem, but it's, it happens in your bones because your blood cells are formed in your bones. So it's technically a blood cell tumor, uh, but the disease manifestation will appear in the bone because it'll cause all kinds of destruction of the bone uh, throughout your body, and uh, it's a very malignant disease. So know these malignant ones uh, compared to the benign ones. Um, moving down, a real common one you probably already know about uh, before you came here to Palmer is just osteoporosis. Okay, but of course osteoporosis, you know, it's okay, weakened bones. But what you will need to know for this exam is some of the, uh, like, it's most common in women, okay? Uh, and it's related to uh, increased thyroid, okay, increased parathyroid hormone production. Um, so basically osteoporosis is a decrease in bone density it's gonna happen naturally, you know, basically to everybody with age, but especially to women, you need to know that. Um, it's associated with uh, scurvy, hyperthyroidism, and hyperparathyroidism. For sure know it's most common to women, and why? You may have to list these reasons. Why is it most common in women? Well, they have less bone mass to begin with, so they have less bone mass to lose. And also, women mature uh, sooner, you know, women uh, in childhood mature sooner, and they also go through menopause and undergo hormonal changes, uh, and they mature into that old age, um, I guess, uh, life changes sooner and more drastically than men do, uh, due to the you know the different hormones and stuff that women have, um, and those big changes that happen with menopause. So basically, they have less bone mass to begin with, uh, and so they have less to lose, and they'll start losing it faster uh, and sooner because of those hormonal changes with menopause. Lastly, we've already talked, to some, talked about this in previous videos, but you got to know Wolf's Law, okay? Force remodels bone, or bones remodel themselves in accordance to the forces enacted upon them, placed upon them, whatever. Uh, stress or force, you know, dictates the, you know, remodeling of bone. There's a lot of different ways you can word it, but you need to be able to rattle this off your tongue in a way that you, in a way that you like and, and write it, because it'll be a test question, I guarantee it. Um, maybe a quiz question as well okay so that takes care of some of the stuff that you're probably pretty comfortable with uh, healing you know basic diseases tumors pretty easy stuff uh, now we're gonna come back up to these hormone pathways which can be a little bit more confusing especially vitamin D but it doesn't have to be okay so we're gonna save vitamin D for last and first look at growth hormone uh, growth hormone pretty straightforward okay growth hormone drives growth uh, there are just some little names that you need to be associated with, uh, with uh, as far as like ages of onset. Okay, so first off, a decrease in growth hormone. If somebody has a problem with their pituitary gland and it does not produce growth hormone from the start of life when they're like you know a little tiny kid, then that is what we call uh, dwarfism or true dwarfism. Um, that's not to be confused with like. Um, the little people, quote unquote, you know, midget, that's politically incorrect, but, um, you know, people with achondroplasia, that's not dwarfism, that's, that's different, okay? D actual dwarfism is a very, very, has a very distinct look. Uh, look it up, okay, Google dwarfism or growth hormone dwarfism, and you'll see a picture of a um, very, very, very tiny, underdeveloped, slender features, very, uh, you know, very, very unique looking, okay? very tiny people um, as opposed to if you uh, have like a, a tumor that uh, a tumor in your pituitary gland that actually increases production of growth hormone 
If that happens when you're a child, uh, you know, before puberty, it's going to result in gigantism. So you'll have just like overall, you know, growth everywhere. You'll be giant, you know, you'll be a giant. Okay. So if, if the growth hormone increase uh, is increased pathologically from childhood age, it results in gigantism. As opposed to if you grow a, a tumor in your pituitary gland as an adult, okay, if you grow a tumor at the age of 25, you know, you're already skeletally mature, you've, you've finished puberty and all, all that, the disease will be called acromegaly, okay? It's different. People still get huge, okay? You can still get big, but it's, uh, it's not as common for people to grow like super tall. Your long bones aren't really gonna get that much bigger. Um, it kind of depends on the situation and the age of onset, but for sure people end up getting like giant jaws and their, their it most, not, most noticeably affects facial features. Um, they'll get huge hands and huge jaws and huge faces and stuff, okay? I'm gonna show you some pictures of both of these just to give you a visual reference. So over here, uh, hopefully you already know who this is, okay? Although, otherwise, uh, you're being enlightened right now. This is Andre the Giant, okay, the greatest pro wrestler of all time. Just kidding, I don't care about that. But this is Andre the Giant. He's this French guy who was a popular, you know, uh, what do you call it, pro wrestling guy right back in the 80s. Um, and he actually had, he was a giant as a kid. Um, he was too big to fit on his school bus as a child, so he had to, like, catch a ride on the, with some guy's, like, special car. Um, because he was like 6'3 as a little kid, as a tiny little kid. Well, not a tiny little kid, but as a young child. And he ended up dying at like, I think 8'4", or something like that. And if you find a different number, then, you know, don't sue me. But anyway, he was huge from an early age. So he had gigantism, okay? He's holding up a bunch of ladies here, just because it makes a good picture. Now, <clears throat> he just looks, you know, pretty normally proportioned, like, you know, his head and his face and all this stuff is pretty equal proportion. He's just big all over the place. As opposed to, uh, <laughs> this is a villain from a James Bond, well, James Bond movies, I think I think it was more than one, I'm not sure, but this guy's name was Jaws, uh, was the character. Uh, he's a large man too, but he, so far as I can see, he was diagnosed with acromegaly. He had an adult, uh, or at least more of an adult age of onset. And so his face is a little weird looking. And if you look up other pictures of him, he has a pretty large jaw. And there are even more distinct uh, pictures if you look up acromegaly, uh, especially um, it can create quite a deformity, which is especially sad, I think, like with young women and stuff, because uh, you'll see pictures of, you know, nice looking women that end up growing these really, really large jaws and they'll get jaw surgeries and everything to try to, um, uh, to try to, uh, you know, bring, make them look more quote unquote normal, okay? This guy's name is Jaws. He had a big jaw. He had acromegaly. Also, please just, please just, nice little, uh, uh, letter association, adults, acromegaly, A and A, okay? Um, adult onset of growth hormone increase is acromegaly, A and A, okay, A, A. Um, pretty straightforward, but just for sure no adult onset versus child onset, okay? Pretty straightforward stuff. Now we're gonna get into the hormones, okay, which are pathways, which, uh, you know, are gonna take a little bit of work. Um, parathyroid hormone, okay, we're gonna look at this next. We talked about it a little bit in previous videos. Uh, there's a simple pathway and then there's a more complex pathway. The simple pathway is that you have a parathyroid gland uh, and it's sitting, you know, basically right behind your thyroid gland in your, in your neck. And blood circulates through this gland. And you need to have calcium in your blood to regulate a whole bunch of cellular activity in your body, uh, to promote you know normal muscle contraction heart contraction etc so you have to have like a regular amount of calcium in your blood if you don't have enough calcium in your blood your parathyroid hormone is going to detect that you don't have enough calcium in your blood so it's going to start kicking out more parathyroid hormone that parathyroid hormone is going to be pumping around in your blood and it's going to stimulate osteoclasts okay to get to work okay and what do osteoclasts do? Well, they lice, okay, or break down bone. And when you break down bone, okay, that puts bone into your blood. And that increases your blood calcium levels to a normal level. This is the normal process. 
There are more steps in here outlined above, but this is the basic thing that you should start with, okay? Parathyroid hormone, if it detects low calcium, because this is just like, this is the normal process that happens all the time. It's just normal fluctuation, keeping your body in homeostasis. So you have decreased calcium, that is gonna make you put out a little bit more parathyroid hormone, which is gonna make osteoclasts lice more bone to release more free calcium to regulate a normal calcium level. If you have a tumor on your parathyroid gland, you're gonna have excess parathyroid hormone production, like way too much, which is gonna get way too many osteoclasts working, which is gonna make way too much bone thinning happen, okay? Too many osteoclasts, doing too much osteoclast stuff means that you've got too much bone destruction, and this can thin your bones uh, and weaken them and cause um, destruction and you know pathological changes, okay? If you wanna look at the complicated pathway, it's up here, it's outlined in your notes as well. There's an intermediate between uh, parathyroid hormone and osteoclast because it technically acts on osteoblasts first and then uh, OPGL will stimulate pre-osteoclast to differentiate into mature osteoclast which will a mature osteoclast lyses bone okay so basically look first look at the simple pathway then look at the more complicated pathway if you can get the simple pathway you'll probably be okay now, last but not least, vitamin D, okay? You're gonna need to know uh, basically this, ta this thing over here, okay? Whatever you call this, a diagram, a flow chart, whatever. Um, first off, you have cholesterol in your body. You need cholesterol in your body. You have cholesterol in your skin. The cholesterol in your skin is called 7-dehydro cholesterol. Okay, so just touch your skin, pinch your skin, and just say 7-dehydro cholesterol, or just, what I like to do is to say 7-dehydro, okay? The less you can say but still understand, the better. You've got 7-dehydro in your skin. When you go outside, which I am right now, and you have sun hit your skin, or if you lay in a tanning bed or whatever, if you have UVB rays hit your skin from the sun, it's gonna convert this cholesterol, 7-dehydro, it's gonna convert it into vitamin D3, which is also called cholecalciferol, okay? So, D3 or cholecalciferol is going to be circulating in your blood and in your liver, vitamin D3 is going to be converted to 25-hydroxy cholecalciferol, okay, or 25-hydroxy vitamin D3. And then that's going to be circulating in your blood and your kidneys are going to act on 25-hydroxy and turn it into 1,25-dihydroxy vitamin D, okay, or vitamin D3, I should say. So <clears throat> there are two numbers, and it's dihydroxy. So I hope that you don't see a question where you have to choose between 125 dihydroxy and 125 hydroxy. But if you do, okay, it's, we're spending five seconds right now, 125. There's two numbers, dihydroxy. Di means two. Also, you have two kidneys. So you have two kidneys that make the one that has two numbers. You have two kidneys that make the one that has dihydroxy, two hydroxy, okay? You only have one liver, which is the one that makes the one number one, all right? As far as just differentiating 25 versus 125. Seven in the skin, um, S and S, seven skin, seven skin, seven skin, okay? You need to know that, that UVB radiation acts on cholesterol in your skin. You need to know that that cholesterol in the skin is technically 7-dehydrocholesterol, okay? But 7-skin is acted on by the sun. That radiation turns 7 in the skin into D3, okay? Uh, we've got some hand signals that I'll show you guys in class that, that kind of might help you uh, keep this straight, um, but we'll hold off on that for now. Okay, so that concludes everything on on this uh on this topic on topic three so thank you guys for tuning in and uh keep at it make sure you understand things uh go back and and review anything you're not clear about ask yourself questions and answer the questions that i posted you should be good to go witless fools do i have to do everything for you